we need to deliver the applications people want. And uh, I tell you, we'll, we'll, we'll start on this, this inner, inside with Arnaud, and we'll ask you first. Well, um, this work? it's on. OK, it's on. Um, the quality of um, WebRTC when you implement as it is um, on really well. I mean, um, the, the quality on the desktop is really amazing. Uh, the first test we, we made, we, we were really uh, surprised. And the thing is, when you want to, to do the same thing on mobile, it's really uh, uh, a big issue. Um, just because the, um, the bit rate is really low, uh, the quality is not so good. So, um, to my point of view, the, the real issue is the, the mobile uh, devices. And also, the, the WebRTC completely depend on the quality of, uh, of the network. Uh, so if you have a good uh, uh, QoS on the, on the network, you can manage the, the flow, and um, uh, you can uh, put a, a bandwidth uh, specific for the, for the WebRTC, and it would work. Um, but when you depend on a, uh, on a network, and you don't have uh, any clue um, how it is managed, um, you should be lucky. <laughs> You're doing a lot of video, so. Yeah, and in fact, with the, with the shop. I'll Mike's up, guys. 15th <laughs> guy in a row to see if his mic's working here. Let's see. As a Cisco guy, it should come as no surprise that uh, when I hear quality of service, I think mostly in terms of quality of service on the network, the path that the media is following. Uh, and as such, with respect to WebRTC, uh, I don't think it's impacting positively or negatively much about what happens once the media hits your wireless network, the middle mile, and all the nasty places where things can go wrong. Uh, our endeavor to ensure you were getting an acceptable video experience was to accommodate for bad network conditions that yield poor quality of service. Uh, so we architected such that we can run over the top in the lowest delivery cost mode possible. Uh, or in the scenarios where we're partnering with those that have robust networks, either at the large enterprise level or at the telco level, that we can actually run media over their network and try to address some of the QoS issues that uh, can create a video experience. So uh, I can speak mostly to the, the voice side of things. And, uh, and from our experience on uh, voice over the public internet, it's actually, actually quite good. Um, and uh, you know, I think in a lot of our, our experience, uh, you know, when we first were doing with this uh, from flash in the browser, uh, the limitations there were, um, you know, around codecs and whatnot were a little bit disappointing, but what we found at WebRTC is, a, a, you know, a greatly improved experience. Um, and, and we generally believe that the Internet is a state where you can have good conversations uh, 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 over, over the web, and it's specifically to voice. And, you know, video is, 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 an, is, is, a, is a whole other beast. Um, and, uh, uh, but for now, we're, we're, we're quite satisfied, and I, we really look at it from our customer satisfaction standpoint. And, you know, what we like to do is always monitor, always make sure that the, 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 the quality is there, and, and then also, you know, help customers figure out what is going on and, and giving them feedback to the user. And it, it, we think a lot about the user and the user's experience and also how you can uh, manage expectations in the browser, much like when, you know, watching a, a video on Netflix or Amazon Player, you, you get some sense of, like, signal strength and, like, how, how good that audio is going to be. Giving that feedback to the user really helps manage the expectation and uh, uh, know what they're going to get. Yeah, so from my perspective, uh, quality of service, it's all about the, the quality of the end user experience. I don't care what, if it's um, a managed network, whatever, it's there. Actually, our focus is we should make sure that the quality can be absolutely, tremendously excellent, <laughs> uh, regardless of if you're using some managed network, QS stuff, or whatever. So, so for us, that's the, the, the key thing is to focus on that the end user experience is absolutely there. Then on top of that, obviously, for, for you guys that are providing services, et cetera, that's where you can differentiate by doing even more on that. But we, we're not going to stop developing to get the best possible experience and assume that the network is as shitty as, uh, as it is. Excellent. So open over to the audience. Any questions from the audience? You guys all just burned out for the day? <laughs> Bill, uh, for the panel, we're talking about now in terms of bandwidth and, and, and QoS. What about when that uh, 2.5 million additional 
users hit the uh, the airwaves and hit the hit the various networks? What kind of QO test problems do you have or anticipate that? Well, if if, if they all upgrade their browsers and CPUs uh, and sort of create a better, heter uh, a less heterogeneous sort of asset that they bring to the encounter, I think we're going to be in fine shape. I, I, I see that the investment in network at a global scale isn't going to, in fact, if nothing, uh, it, more than anything else, it's going to accelerate based on the type of numbers that we saw earlier today. And I haven't seen anything that uh, yeah. you mean to I, otherwise. I, I, I think basically, I mean, we all know that everything is getting better in terms of uh, capacity at all, but at the same time, you are have the the other effect of getting more uh, uh, services, more users, whatever that want to use it. So, and it seems like it always continues to to just uh, pan out pretty roughly that everything improves slightly, but not as fast as it could if you didn't add users, for example. So, I'm not worried. I don't think anything will break down tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But it, it means that it's not a challenge that going away just because you get better pipes or whatever. Yeah. I, I myself, I'm not worried about the, uh, the, the Internet. I, I do think an area of, of not concern, just a challenge, uh, like, like, uh, like you said, is on mobile. And that's an area where those networks are, 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 so, are, are so poor for what we're, what we're doing and, and we're really excited about things like you know, LTE. But like, that's a whole area where I think uh, will continue to be challenging for a, uh, an optimal user experience. Um, Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Yell it out. There are no things within WebRTC to set priority on these uh, media streams or anything that the network can interpret. So, that. so, so the question, the question was, <laughs> was there doesn't appear to be in WebRTC anything to be able to set priorities on media streams. How, how do we manage priority on media streams within WebRTC? Well, again, uh, I, I've never been a big believer of, of uh, trying to, to uh, compartmentalize uh, these things. It's, it should, should work anyway. But of course, you can do that in, in, in uh, certain ways uh, within the network anyway. So it's, it's, it doesn't exclude that possibility. But we cannot assume that that's the case. And we don't want to assume that that's the case. Dean? How are we going to uh, uh, deal with people running multiple concurrent WebRTC tabs in their browsers or apps or, or you, know, you, you have two problems. Firstly, which, which browser window is ringing at me? And the other one is, if, you know, if I have two browser windows are talking to me at the same time, what happens? So the, the question is, <laughs> is when you have multiple browser windows trying to talk to you at the same time or ringing to you at the same time, how do you identify which one is actually the one you want to talk to? and keep from becoming totally schizophrenic? I think that was the question. Well, in, in, in many ways, it's a, it's a step better than when it is today when you have several applications that don't talk to each other. Now at least you're in one browser, typically, and that mm -hmm. actually talk to, to, to the other tabs and, and can, can figure something out. So It implies application interoperability uh, for different <coughs> applications, different tabs. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it's at least, so for example, we. The, the browser knows something, and so the browser can add value that you can't do otherwise. Yeah, you'd imagine you could force it down to the application to, you know, in, in this case, if there's an application or with a stream, stream live, what do you want to do? And at this point, it would be incumbent upon the application to be smart and, and drive that, that user experience. And I, I think for us, that, that, that's fair and something we can work with. And like you said, this, you know, a schizophrenic experience where you have different things happening here and there. Um, obviously, I, I much prefer an area where I can have some control, where I can do something. Uh, I can't do something with my, uh, with, 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 with the way things are today. Isn't there embedded in that question a, a concept of uh, how identity is going to be managed? That someone has, multiple people have reached you at the same identity within different tabs or applications, and that somebody ought to be doing something to, to manage traffic to that identity. I think that brings actually there's an interesting question that you know and it was brought up in one of the earlier panels that you know the concept of push and I think that's one of the things that's really missing in WebRTC is and it's a little bit more than push it's it's really along the lines of when I go to a website can I register with that website that that right website has the right to interrupt me mm -hmm. which is really what you know if you think about the phone system the phone system you give a device the right to interrupt you and 
that becomes kind of an exclusively given right. What's interesting about WebRTC is, you know, are we going to have a way to extend that right to multiple sites so they can interrupt you? When I turn my browser on, it knows which sites can interrupt you and tells it tells those sites where it is because obviously the browser changes with IP addresses. Yeah. So it's I mean, an interesting thought process. Is that, is that something that seems important to you guys to work out? To me, it almost seems like we're asking, can the browser start talking to us? And anyways, I, I'm thinking about this, and like, I'm thinking about my Android phone. I have a bunch of processes running in the background, and I, I let them all be there, and I let them all notify me and let me, me going. Are we going to start letting the browser morph into something more than just, just Windows um, and just applications contained in those windows? And does, it, does the browser have identity? Does the browser, you know, when you start up your browser, you log into some service that lets you be called? And, um, I know that's a, that's a question of the browser people. I, th I think it's interesting. Uh, what I would be scared about is the, the, the browser morphing into this horrendous beast that can do all this stuff. And um, there's something nice and clean that the, the, uh, in the current model. But obviously, uh, there's a lot of things to be thinking about. But what, what does the browser become? What does Chrome become? Well, I, I think, wouldn't it be nice if you just sign in to your Google account and, and, and then everybody reads you? I, I don't see what, what else we need to discuss. <laughs> Pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Colin. So, what, you know, on all these things, we have a balance of I don't want everyone in every website to have access to my camera. And on the other hand, I don't want to be constantly clicking yes to dialogue boxes and saying, can I send something to access my camera? How, how do you guys feel the right balance can be met between them? What, what, you know, what is your view of the balance, or how do we get to having the right balance? I have one aesthetic request that's actually right out of that territory, Colin. I was going to raise it independently if I didn't have a chance to do it here. I'd like for those notifications not to look like <laughs> malware or other pop-up notifications. I'd like it to be visually obvious that it's a, it's a productivity and communication thing that's about to happen. You're not something that's about to harm your computer. It's a very simple thing at a user level, but someone sitting in an enterprise setting is going to see that same banner I see from time to time. Yeah, but there is something you said, the standardization of that. It looks just like the location permission, just the other crap. It, it doesn't look good, but it's better than Flash, <coughs> right? So, but it keeps them from using the application. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get, I mean, it is just, well, just it, launched. But, so. but that's fine for you that hopefully are providing a, 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 a real nice service that actually is not there to harm me. But right. the other one, it, it looks the same. So it's, it's kind of nice if it looks a little bit scary. <laughs> Uh, so it, it's not an easy trade-off between, between the two, I think. It, it, maybe not scary, but descriptive and clear. I mean, yeah. like, that's what like, I'm getting yeah, yeah. at. No, 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 I'm just exaggerating. Well, it's, but we don't want a, a play where we, you know, Android and those permissions and like course location, what the hell does that mean? Like most users, like, so too much specificity is, yeah. uh, is a concern. So, so you know, is that the, uh, the biggest security concern? What are the other security concerns other than you know, controlling the camera, how you do that, how do you keep it from being malware? What are some of the other things that you are think are concerns that could really limit WebRTC and its adoption? I mean, should we be worried about, you know, denial of service attacks on web servers? Does that change things? Uh, you know, and I think there's actually one question here that's, uh, you know, the concept of a rogue app. I mean, it's an interesting perspective. When I give the app the right to access my camera, how do I know where that app is sending the camera picture? Do I know, in fact, that it's only sending that camera picture to the person I'm talking to and it's not sending it to somebody else who happens to be recording it on some website somewhere? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. So thought process, what are the security concerns we have to think about that if something blew up would cause people to say, we don't trust this and we won't use it? Well, in the same way as any other service, you, you have to to trust your service provider in, in, in certain ways. They're, they're, they're when, you, when you set it up, you, you, you give some trust there. And that's where the, the problems may occur. But uh, the most important thing is that nobody can just hijack your camera or your microphone. You have deliberately allowed them to do it. Right. And as soon as you do that, you have, it's obviously an education issue because uh, just because you do that, not every user will understand that that means that they can send it wherever they want to, right. more or less. But, uh, uh, and then the other obvious, very important security part of it is that it should not be possible for a third party to, to exactly. tap into yeah. to what you do in there. So again, the one that you allow to get access to it, that's the only one that should be able to see anything of it. And on the network, it's always secure. It's always encrypted on the network. 
that's that's a key uh, talent of, of this this whole effort. I mean, that's actually an interesting point. Is I, I think Apple's made a lot of of hay out of you know in the App Store that apps are tested and they're trusted. I mean, do we need kind of to develop the uh, good housekeeping seal of approval for WebRTC apps that they're not doing? <laughs> right? I mean, no, it's an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's Apple. I'm just saying. Do we need something like that, or are consumers not going to realize, and are there going to be issues? I mean, we, we, we have our distribution channels and uh, for even for web apps in, in the web store, and we obviously need to, in order to, to allow that method to go through there, we have to, to provide some kind of value by, by limiting that risk. So that's one method, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way you can do this, and we, yeah. you can you can't do that. You, yeah, you, you, and then the thing is, when, like the biggest concern I'd have is getting in, in, in front of innovation and like you know, if, uh, you know, when I think of like the most horrific model I can think of, and it's like you know, this is a little bit related to this world, but like when I think about how you go about provisioning short codes, if anyone's done that, it's really painful and it just you don't get any innovation. That's why there's never been innovation in SMS. But like I don't, we, nothing should get in the way of people being able to create. Um, and that's like would be a that would be a terrifying. What, what whether it's a store and, and then that gives an extra trust for people who want to only go from a store. Yeah, that's the prerogative. Uh, I, I think where we might benefit from some governance well in advance of uh, the, the topic you raised, Phil, would be around um, some sort of objective understanding of where all of the browser providers are with respect to um, implementing all the shoulds and musts, and knowing that there's a, a unified uh, offer from compliant browser to compliant browser. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what body exists today to ensure that all the shoulds and musts are being implemented in a way that doesn't fracture the system. Uh, so, so you want a, an authority that goes out and... I hate the word authority, but I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm signing up for it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so what you're saying is, as an app vendor, knowing that the functionality, that there's a set of commonality of functionality across the browsers, yes. and certain functions, especially in these, some of these security areas, may be pretty important. To a baseline sure. that we can all build to, so that from one enterprise to the next, you know, there's an IE enterprise out there, there's a Chrome enterprise out there, that what we've built for them will work on a consistent basis because right. the standard has been respected at some baseline level, and to know that as we start to build. I mean, of course, that's, it's in our interest to start with, uh, <laughs> and we, that's why we have standards, and that's why the standard says what is must, what is should, etc. And if you don't do that, uh, yeah, you, you could uh, have uh, someone to go and knock you on the head, but uh, I'm not sure that's really yeah. going to happen. I, I think it's going to work out really well anyway, because it's absolutely in our interest, and Otherwise, it's, it's not working. In, and as we, I mean, that's what we're working on every day here, really, really hard to make sure that we set the right expectations and only require the, the, what you have to do there. And then there, there can be differences, but as long as everything is interoperable and you can write uh, code that, that works in all browsers without too much extra work, then, then we're good. Yeah. So for all of you here, what's been your, the, from the developer side, you know, obviously Google here on, from the Chrome side, what's the thing that they could do that would make your life better? What was the challenge, you know, what was the, the biggest thing that you saw in your development that you say, hey guys, you really have to take care of this and help, help us fix this? Your biggest headache. Uh, that, well, the, the biggest headache that we experienced, and uh, we took it on ourselves. We knew this would be the case. So spec churn and like knowing, uh, you know, implementing our, our product against uh, WebRTC when it wasn't stable yet. But guess what? We knew that was the case. And because we wanted to be when it was in Chrome 23, we wanted to be there. Um, so that was frustrating, but uh, to be expected. And I, I think uh, from our side, it was, it was pretty much, we were overall pleased. And I think that the frustration really is, is that. The question is when we take what we did for uh, Chrome, and then we go and try to implement it for, for Firefox, is it going to just work? Um, and and, and, and we, we, seeing that is the case, and it, we're actually we're, we're doing that right now, uh, but that's, that's our real area of concern. Once things have stabilized, once we go to the next browser, the next browser, is it just going to be easy, or are we going to have to, you know, fiddle and, uh, and whatnot? Yeah, so that's interesting. I, can I just ask for, for everyone's here? Uh, 
thoughts on if the process we are, have been following is the right one. I, I mean, for us, obviously, waiting till the standard is done is not necessarily the best way to, to, to build a standard because you need to get it out and be tested. Do you think that we've released it too early or at about the right stage or at that, that the churn has been too big or that it's kind of uh, uh, roughly what, what you would expect or what you want it to be? Uh, so it was roughly what, what we expected. We also, uh, as we saw lots of churn, we held off on the development and then once we saw things uh, 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 firming up, we definitely put more resources against it and that sort of, it, we wanted to be part of the conversation, we wanted to see what was going on. Um, you know, obviously we'd always like things faster. You know, I wanted this two quarters ago, naturally, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm just gonna be realistic. And, but, but near the end, it was fine. And still, you know, I'm still concerned when Chrome 24 comes out, is, is my app gonna work? Um, guess what, you know, it doesn't right now, so now we're fiddling and making sure, and, but, but uh, you know, it should be fixed by next week. But th that's the type of stuff, and so it's maybe not specific where we're CC, but working against Chrome. And yeah. what's, what's in Chrome, is, is, is that the real standard, or is it, you know, so? We've, uh, we've led Parallel Lives at 10 Ants to my pal here from Twilio. Uh, I have some smart guys over there against the side who thought long and hard about when we would choose to synchronize and catch up. Um, to try to put a commercial service in meant that we needed to know to pick the right time and point resources at that. The first catch up to where Chrome was was the hardest one. They've become subsequently more easy. And I would settle in with about the same answer you provided, Thomas, that we're pretty satisfied with the pace of change and the churn <coughs> because we had to systematize how we accommodated it into our workflow. That was expected. Okay. I, I don't think you could do anything better. OK. Thanks. And it landed. So <laughs> finally, <laughs> yeah. Right I, I thought it was going to unfortunately slip into Q1 or Q2, but like Q4 actually meant Q4 eventually. So that was great. I know. You had a comment there? Well, <clears throat> um, well, we already have the pro to be one of the first uh, uh, application uh, which is live. You can use it uh, uh, you, you, you use the Chrome 23, that's all. Uh, so Mike? Hello? Guy? It's on, yeah. <laughs> So once again. <laughs> So, um, so the, um, Chrome, the, the, the 23rd uh, version of Chrome is really an opportunity for B3 to be one of the first uh, implementation of WebRTC uh, for everyone. So you just need uh, Chrome 23 and uh, you can make a video call with, uh, with WebRTC. Um, the, the biggest part was to, uh, uh, to let the user know how um, to deal with the, the button with the acceptation uh, button. <laughs> like, can you click here, then <laughs> click there, then click over there, <laughs> and finally, you can see the other person. Um, but once uh, it, it's done, you can click and, and select a, a combo, and then uh, each time you use B3, you don't have to click on, on this all uh, button. So, um, for me, it's a Tory uh, opportunity uh, to have implemented Chrome 33. Um, I'm dying to uh, to implement uh, the the same uh, the same service uh, in Firefox and also uh, on the mobile uh, devices. Any other questions from the audience? You got to have some burning questions out there. Yeah. Any comments on the forecast for integration in Google Apps? No. <laughs> no, uh, well, I, I mean, I, we, we, I don't give out any timelines on anything, so I, I rather not really dwell into it. Though. Good. Um, how much of uh, what's going between the device and the network on WebRTC is encrypted and any thoughts on what it's likely to look like to a DPI box or a policy server or something like that in the network? You want me to talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, it, it is encrypted from endpoint to endpoint. There you go. <laughs> is, that, is, it, but is it still identifiable? Yeah, will, will there be an obvious, that looks like WebRTC signature, even if you can't actually tell what's in I don't know the 
if that's possible, uh, I would have to ask someone like Helen or, or Justin or so. But they're not paying attention, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other audience questions? So here's an interesting question. Uh, how many end users do you think will have a WellBoats RTC enabled device at the end of 2013 and the end of 2014? I mean, we've heard numbers, a couple of billion, two and a half billion devices out there, another two and a half billion devices coming, four billion devices by 2016. So I mean, one of the big questions that I think everybody's gonna ask is, what's the market opportunity? We may all think it's four billion by 2014, and what do we think it is by the end of 2013, the end of 2014? Are we talking tens of millions of people? Or are we talking hundreds of millions of endpoints and, well, and accessible users? Already today, we have hundreds of millions. Yeah. So that's, that's easy to answer. Yeah. So we'd hope it would be built into all modern browsers. That would, that would make me happy. Uh, and there you go. There's hundreds of millions of people. Um, and then you know, how, how, how the manifestation of this on mobile and thinking about that and, 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 and uh, how, how we can build it into to, like SDKs that we run, that would be interesting. I, I think um, it would be great to, for it to be in, in, in mobile Chrome, uh, but I, 2014, I don't know, you think? Oh, in mobile Chrome, yes. That would oh. be in 2013. 20, oh, there you go. That, uh, that as, as much as that, I, yeah, can, well, I, I can probably Q4. say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, hearing stuff like that, I mean, you know, there you go. You got, you got Android, you got modern web browsers, that's billions. Other than Apple, that's the only thing we need to worry about still. Well, Android's doing. I mean, I, I love, I love, I love Apple products as well. But you know, you look, just look at Android numbers, and that's pretty impressive. So you'll have a large addressable audience. I keep coming back to you guys. Any other questions? Somebody's out there's got to have a exciting and controversial question, don't you? No. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, well, I think uh, maybe to clarify, uh, the browser is a client, and I was talking about what the, the any certification of browsers. I don't think uh, that we have uh, necessarily certification of other endpoints and, and need to introduce that for this. So that's okay. that's my. So let me ask a question. So if you had one feature that's not for each of the, the teams that have done development, the one feature that wasn't in WebRTC that you really like to see there, what was it? Or not, was there something that you, know, you couldn't do that WebRTC didn't let you do that you really wanted to be able to do? Or is it complete and 100% met all your dreams? <laughs> Perfect. Your fantasies are complete. Um, no, my fantasies are not completed yet. Um, <clears throat> Once the, the WebRTC uh, connection is uh, established, uh, okay, you can see the other person, etc. cetera, um, but you don't have uh, any control anymore uh, on the devices. I mean, you can switch off the camera and switch on, and the same with the, the input or the microphone. If you have multiple uh, inputs, you can switch from, another, uh, from one to another uh, during a call. So we probably... Uh, so you're saying that the fact that the, the inputs are static once they're set yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. And the inability to kind of move between them dynamically mm -hmm. within, a, within a connected WebRTC transmission flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, mine are pretty simple. If you were here earlier for Todd Simpson's Prezo, I, I really like the, uh, how you solve the what's on top, the, um, right. the API that floated across tab to tab. I thought right. that was a neat thing and very usable in a deployment uh, where a 
user may lose track of where that is. Um, at, a, at a maybe more macro level, uh, I'd love for the codec issue, to, the video codec issue, to be resolved. Um, so I, I can speak mostly from the voice side. We haven't played enough uh, around enough with the video side of things. I'm sure there's there's plenty there that we'd, we'd comment on. But uh, actually, I think the simplest thing is back to your permit permissions. Like, and that, I know that's Chrome. It's not uh, inherently WebRTC. But there's uh, there's something about that just that that barrier to to, to start interacting. Um, on the voice side, I also say that uh, it's pretty fresh and new for us. So I, I think uh, the issues that we find uh, will, will will be great when we have the hundreds of thousands of users uh, bashing on our product, and then all of a sudden, hey, I want to, uh, our developers saying, I want to do this, I want to do that, and us trying to to, to fig figure out where what we can and cannot do. For now, it's good, but obviously, we're gonna we're gonna we're obviously gonna want things. <clears throat> yeah, you're bringing up things that we are aware of and that we are working on and iterating, for example, device selection and, and handling that's something that we are improving and, and, and it will, obviously you don't get it absolutely right the first time. The permission things and the actual user interface, it's, uh, it's coming a refresh here in M25 and that will come more after that. It's, it's definitely, it's good, good feedback and we, we hopefully will address it as, as well as we can in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, Come back to a point Mark you made. So, video codecs has been a discussion, and there's obviously, uh, you know, there's two very interesting questions about video codecs. You know, do you use a video codec that has, that is an open source, essentially quote unquote free, let's say, video codec, or one of the codecs that has royalties associated with it and the quality differences? I mean, kind of, let's have a discussion about what do we think is the right path for WebRTC? Should we support every, both kinds? Is one more important than the other? What's the right path moving forward? And if we do get into the royalty environment, how do we manage the way royalties work? So any thought process? I think that's that? a separate conference that you need to put together. <laughs> 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 well, we've got seven minutes left, so we can have a long conversation solve, about it. We're going to wrap this up in seven minutes. Right, seven mm -hmm. minutes. It, it, I mean, any thoughts? I mean, it seems to me that that's one of the big issues, which is, you know, if, if we end up with, you know, an H.264, how are we going to manage the cost structure of that? Obviously, I, I mean, I don't think Google's want to, want to pay for it in the, in the browser. Um, is it going to get paid for in the service site? How does that impact service delivery? How do you account for it, you know, et cetera, et cetera? So it's, it's an interesting question, I think, that one that we really do, I see, have to resolve fairly quickly. So just, I mean, your thoughts is going out with applications, video especially, yeah. you know, Mark, in your case, how do you see that kind of coming together? Our choice was very simple. We're venture-funded startups, so we chose the least cost delivery modes available to us, from AWS to, to everything that Google so graciously put out there for us right. to use. And we'll continue down that path until uh, we have to choose otherwise. Uh, and, and what I'd like to be able to get to is steady state as quickly as possible. At a technical level, we can all probably do almost anything. Right. It may be additional friction or additional payload. Some burden will be extracted for doing something that's inelegant. Uh, but the faster we get to that steady state, the more quickly application providers like us can accommodate it. So if someone says, look, it's going to be a two codec environment, we'll figure out a way to make it work. But don't make us wonder whether it's going to be a two codec environment for the next two years and wonder why WebRTC didn't become the disruptive force we all want it to be. Any other comments on that? Yeah, we're getting through. Go, yes, sir. So that, the question yeah. was, why don't we put a SIP stack on WebRTC and turn WebRTC into a SIP phone? I, th I think yeah. that was the question. Uh, yeah, so that's where actually the whole WebRTC discussion started uh, two years ago. And uh, it was, I, I think, uh, pretty clear that that's not the, the best model. Uh, we don't want to create a SIP soft phone. We want to create something that is really flexible and, and uh, can do can, can, can provide real-time communication as a feature inside any app, and you should not have to deal with SIP just because you want to do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, you, you can add zip if you want to. Uh, uh, there is JavaScript for that. Yes. Yeah, and both of them are mostly uh, being hashed out in the in the standards on how to do it uh, the proper way. And as soon as that is getting closer, we'll we'll implement them. This side of the room, you guys haven't asked we me have questions. Failed, so we have we have someone waving very. There, go back. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so it's, the question is around the, uh, helping the end user getting a good experience uh, because they don't know exactly what they, what, what's happening there. And, and absolutely, we, we have a lot of that already. And, and obviously, you compare with Flash, and it's, uh, the, the stack that's sitting in, in, in what we have is, uh, is a, a, a slight notch uh, higher up on, on the scale there in terms of, of quality of that. But we also continue to develop in that area to do auto detection of, of uh, w whether there is any audio coming, if the audio is distorted, et cetera. So it's definitely an area that it's, it's better than what you have experienced on Flash and what we have today. It can get even better in the future. I'll, I'll echo that. And from our experiences, both using Flash and, uh, and WebRTC, uh, that, that is the case. And I think also the inherent challenge is computers as things you can talk to. Many, there are still many out there that are not set up to actually do that well. They have crappy microphones. And uh, people's expectations, it, it's really interesting, users' expectations versus what they can actually do with it is, is a mismatch that we need to, to figure out. And as great as software you could write, a shitty microphone is still going to sound like a, a, a shitty microphone. And so what's nice is computers more and more, the, 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 the hardware being built in is better and better. I think there will be a point where we won't have to worry as much because the inputs are just, are just better. Just a, a comment and a thought process on that. I, I believe fundamentally most PCs have a camera and microphone that are installed in a checkbox for the outside of the box that says it has it. And users don't trial them. I think the interesting thought with WebRTC is when we get it out there, when people go into Costco to look at a PC, they're actually going to try to make a WebRTC call with it and see how it works on a video. I mean, ima you know, imagine for a moment you're out buying the uh, PC at Costco, and it's really easy to click on a website and make a communication to a friend because it's there, and you can evaluate the quality of that device for real time before you buy it. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I got to tell you, I got an HP PC. I like HP; they're fine. The camera sucks, and but it's checked that it has a great HD camera. Well. It's HD and half definition as far as I'm concerned. So, and, and by the way, that's pretty typical, right? Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's once people actually start to use it, because nobody checks that. When you buy a computer in the store, today, almost everybody checks the quality of the microphone, the quality of the experience. The minute we have this technology, people will actually start to care about it. And therefore, we'll get a, a massive improvement in quality of the devices. Or alternatively, of course, that's always an advertisement for the guys in the back right of the room which is to get yourself a wearable I.O. device that improves that experience. Yeah. Can, can we get just a little bit of feedback from Julio as to uh, metrics around uh, success rate of a completed call using Flash versus WebRTC? Can you get to that? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the biggest difference for us is just its overall quality. And, and speaking back to your, you're talking about using uh, free software as much as possible. So we went, we went the route with Flash that we didn't have to uh, uh, license Flash servers. Um, and so we were doing it TCP over, uh, over the internet. That was not great for audio. Uh, with, with you guys, we're using UDP, so that's great. The codec's better. So, so in general, I would say experientially, 
uh, the, the, the quality is significantly better. From connectivity and whatnot, that was, it's pretty much the same. But that, 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 the, the key thing is, what's, what does it sound like? And, and that's where we've gotten the, 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 uh, the best uh, feedback. I mean, we launched our, 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 our Twilio client with WebRTC support about three weeks ago. I would say as a volume of traffic, probably about two thirds has moved over, uh, of our customers uh, have moved over to that and implemented, uh, implemented that and, and, and rely on, on, on WebRTC. Excellent. And I, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our, our time. I'd like to thank the panel.